Up Close with Chris Williams is presented by Tenova Healthcare with six hospitals and more than 1,000 dedicated physicians. For more information, tenova.com. Welcome to Up Close, I'm Chris Williams. As technology in the medical field continues to progress, it will have profound effects on patients in need of treatment. In recent years, it's likely many of you watching have heard about the use of robotics in surgery and how the use of robotics is having many positive outcomes when used in surgery. I recently visited with Tennessee native Dr. Christopher Ramsey. Dr. Ramsey specializes in treating prostate cancer and utilizes robotics in his practice. You will see why so much attention has been given to the use of robotics in many types of surgical procedures. I was curious to know how Dr. Ramsey's career evolved to his using this new technology. But first, I wanted to learn about his younger days growing up in Tennessee. Dr. Ramsey, I wanted to first talk about your credentials. And I understand that you completed your first degree in 1991 and uh, your medical degree later in residency. Where were those uh, completed? I went to Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, graduated in 1991 from, from Dartmouth, and then went to the University of Toledo Medical College, uh, finished in 1997, and then went to uh, residency in Oklahoma, at the University of Oklahoma, and finished in 2002, and then returned back home to Knoxville there. Wow, so Knoxville is home. Clinton, Tennessee is home. Clinton, so Tennessee. A little, little north of Knoxville, but that's home. Outstanding. So earlier in your life, uh, when did you make the determination that you wanted to be a physician? And then I guess specifically later, a urologist? Well, when I was, when I was born, I was born with a, a defect of my urethra and actually had surgery as a very young child. And my first memories are actually being in a hospital and my first memories are being with a urologist. And I was very, very fortunate to uh, be able to come back and practice with my original treating urologist uh, when, I, when I finished residency, which was a, a really big honor for me to, to come back to the guy who, who was my mentor, the guy who really inspired me to become a, become a physician. So as I grew up, really the only thing I knew was that I wanted to be a doctor because I, I saw how they helped people and, and it was, it was uh, you know, a big impact on my life. You said the word inspiring. Yeah. That's incredibly yeah. inspiring. And what a great honor, I guess, to be able to practice with him. Right. Now you are what is called board certified. Right. And for the layman at home, what do we mean by board certified? Board certification requires that you finish medical school. You go to a accredited residency program. And then after a, a year and a half, you first take a test after you finish your residency. And then a year and a half, you take an oral examination um, similar to this <laughs> and uh, uh, when you pass that then you become board, certi board certified and typically you're board eligible until you finish those and then usually every 10 years you have to take a recertification test which I'm getting ready to do in about two weeks so wish me luck. A lot of studying going on <laughs> right is, now huh? There is. <laughs> Trying to stay abreast of everything. All right. Let's talk about technology. And I know that you are very noted for utilizing the Da Vinci robot-assisted prostate um, uh, surgery. And what do we mean when we say robot-assisted? Uh, robot-assisted is a way to do a laparoscopic procedure. So it's a minimally invasive procedure where you do uh, really large procedures with smaller incisions in the abdomen. And you fill the belly up with air, and then the robot is connected to the, to the abdomen through tubes. And the robot has very small hands that allows you to do really small, delicate, detailed maneuvers, and it takes away your tremor. Ten times magnification, three-dimensional vision, it just really enhances your ability to, to do what we would do with our hands um, and now in a, with, within a smaller environment um, and just to be able to do it with less, hopefully less pain, less bleeding, quicker recovery. Those are the main benefits that I see of, of using robot-assisted surgery. I find that to be so fascinating. It's really changed the way I do, practice, do medicine. Right, and so how many of the robot-assisted surgeries have you actually performed at this point? I've done 781 prostates as of yesterday and probably close to 900 surgeries with the robot in total. 
I wanted to talk about the fact that it appears that when you turn on the television so many times, you hear the comedians and the late night host making jokes about the prostate examination. But truly, it really isn't a laughing matter, is it? No, it, it's, it's not a laughing matter. It's, 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 it's nothing that any man likes to do. Uh, but the, the way I look at it, we actually have it pretty easy compared to women who, at the age of 18 or whenever, right. start to get vaginal exams. And they right. don't like that any more than we do. And, and it's probably a little more comfortable for us than it is for them. And we don't have to start doing it typically till 40 or 50 years old. So we get a long reprieve. So we're lucky. So uh, rectal exam is, is, is a laughing matter and to some extent. And I always apologize before I do it. Sure. Uh, but uh, it's something that's very necessary uh, with the advent of PSA, which is a prostate-specific antigen that has helped us identify prostate cancers earlier before they've had a chance to spread in the most part. Uh, we, we use that in conjunction with the digital rectal exam. The, the PSA can find typically 75% of prostate cancers, but it will miss 25% or, or so of prostate cancers. So you have to do both of them in, in conjunction in order, to, in order to really get a good idea of what's going on with the prostate. So what is the likelihood that someone will actually be facing prostate cancer in their lifetime? It's the most common uh, cancer identified in men. So one in six men have prostate cancer, and that's without a family history. It's, it's more prevalent in men who have a family history. So typically we'll start screening men who have a family history. Black men are actually at higher risk for prostate cancer. So that needs to be started at age 40 with a rectal exam and a PSA. Uh, men who don't have a family history uh, will need to be started, uh, will need to start checking at age, age 50. I understand that now men are most likely being diagnosed earlier. Is that due maybe to the technology? Yes, absolutely. We, we definitely have an increased detection in men who are younger with prostate cancer. Um, and and it's, it's really helped, helped us catch this disease in an earlier, uh, earlier uh, grade and stage, whereas before the advent of PSA, we were finding cancers because the prostate felt very firm and it was very hard. And typically it had already spread outside the boundaries of the, of the prostate. And so now we're finding more and more cancers early. I wanted to ask you uh, maybe when is surgery an idea treatment? Well, you're asking a surgeon that question. Right. So that's, <laughs> I, I think surgery is always the ideal treatment. <laughs> However, that's, that's obviously my bias. And it's important for the, the patient to understand that there are multiple options for a prostate cancer treatment. And surgery is one of those options. Um, just because I think it's a great option because that's what I do day in and day out doesn't necessarily mean that's right for the, for the patient. So surgery is a, a good option when the patient is healthy, can tolerate surgery. And that's mm -hmm. the, the first thing that you want to want to consider when you're looking at a patient. Um, and and you know, then really anybody is a, is a good candidate for, for surgery. The, probably the, a patient who would not be as good of a candidate is a patient who's had multiple abdominal surgeries before for, for, other, uh, for other surgeries, for motor vehicle accidents, uh, who, and, and who have, may have a lot of scar tissue in their abdominal cavity. And that makes laparoscopy harder to do, and there's a higher risk for injuring some internal structures. So Let's talk about risk. Sure. What are some of the risks? So with robot-assisted laparoscopic surgery, the risks are the, the same as any other surgery, bleeding, infection, damage to surrounding structures. Uh, when you're dealing with the prostate, the two main things that men worry about are going to be incontinence or leakage of urine and then impotence or inability to uh, maintain an erection. Mm -hmm. And so those are two really important factors that probably require most of my time when I'm discussing treatment options for prostate cancer. Uh, fortunately, with our techniques, uh, most people do very well with, with the incontinence. I typically tell my patients about 85% of the patients will become completely dry. It may take several weeks or several months, but uh, most people will do very well. Uh, 10 to 15 percent will have permanent, though usually mild leakage, where you may have to change a, a pad in your underwear a couple times a day. Mm -hmm. It is an irritation, but it, it doesn't change their life. Right. Um, one to two percent of the time, the leakage can be very persistent and very severe. And if it's several months after surgery, they're still wearing multiple pads because they really can't control their incontinence, then mm -hmm. they may need a surgical procedure to correct that. And there's several things that can be done. So we don't ignore that, and you don't have to be wet. Um, but that's that's a, a main consideration when you're when you're thinking about surgery specifically. Um, and impotence is also something that you, you worry about. I, I tell my sure. patients that really your recovery really depends on the type of cancer that you have. Is it, is it encompassing a large amount of the prostate? Is it a small amount of the prostate? Mm -hmm. Are we able to spare the nerves that allow you to have erections? And th those go right down alongside of the prostate. So if you've got a lot of prostate cancer in the prostate, 
we may not be able to spare those nerves and you won't be able to get an erection on your own and we may have to do something to help with that. Right. Patients who are younger and, and healthier and have no problems with erections typically do very well. Patients who are older and already have problems aren't going to get any better from surgery and, right. and may, have, may have significant problems afterwards. So those are all things that you, you talk about with, with your patients about the, the considerations uh, for, for prostate cancer treatment, especially surgery. Uh, the other treatment options can affect erections and, and uh, incontinence as well, uh, but those are the things we talk about with surgery specifically. Let's talk about types of surgery. Okay. I understand there are four of those. Four main types, I would say. Uh, traditionally, we uh, remove the prostate with an abdominal incision from the belly button mm -hmm. down to the pubic bone. Right. So an incision, you know, several centimeters long, mm -hmm. and uh, remove the prostate that way. Uh, there is a, a procedure that's not used by many, many people. There are several areas in the country that will remove it through a perineal incision. And the perineum is the area between your scrotum and your rectum. So right. uh, it's, it's a, a little more of a minimally invasive procedure. And, uh, but there's just not a lot of experience with that for most you know, urological surgeons. So we, we don't talk about that very often. And then there are the laparoscopic techniques. You can do it with just regular laparoscopy without the assistance of a robot. That's very technically difficult. Uh, most most surgeons aren't, aren't really able to do that, and, and I've never done one of those. I'd, I'd consider that my colleagues who can do that very, very good surgeons. Um, so I kind of cheat with the robot, and <laughs> the robot really helps me, you know, uh, become a better laparoscopist is, is the way that I look at that. Right. And, and so I've, I've really brought that into my, into my practice, and I haven't done an open surgery in seven and a half years now. Fortunately, I haven't needed to. So um, it's been, uh, it's been a, a really big improvement on the way that I do surgery, it's also helped with my understanding of the anatomy of the prostate too. You know, with the, in, with the incision, you know, there's really not a lot of room in there for more than one and a half people, you and the, and the assistant who's right. you know, helping retract tissues and, and suck the blood. And, and really it's hard for the assistant to even see. With the robot, everybody in the room sees because it's on a TV screen. Right. And so everybody's watching and you can actually get feedback from your, your assistants and from the nurses and from even anesthesia to say, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And everybody can be involved in the surgery and can see what's going on. So I think that's really helpful too. When would you consider using radiation? Radiation is another good option for, for prostate cancer. I think that it's it, in the patient who was considering surgery, that, that patient has to consider radiation therapy as well. Uh, the patients specifically who I think would do well with radiation therapy are going to be older patients who may not be as healthy, who wouldn't be able to tolerate a, any type of surgical procedure and want to do something about prostate cancer. Those patients, you typically have to ask the question, do you really need to do anything at all about prostate cancer? Because the prostate cancer is typically sl very slow growing. Typically, I tell my patients, about half the patients who are diagnosed with prostate cancer will die within 10 years. That's kind of the, the typical average. So it's slow, it, but it's a, a definite risk. If you don't have 10 years left to live, and that's, that's a tough conversation that you have to have with yourself, look yourself in the mirror and say, how much longer do I have left to live? We don't have an expiration date stamped on our rear end, so right. we, we don't know. And if you don't have 10 years left to live, then maybe just doing nothing at all is, is, is a good option. But radiation therapy is good for people who, who do not want to have a surgical procedure, uh, just are afraid to death to have any type of surgery done, and those people are smart people. You know, surgery has risks, and so, so you really have to be have to be really thoughtful about what you want to do. So um, patients who've had previous you know, multiple abdominal surgeries may not be a good candidate for, for uh, surgery, so radiation therapy may be a good, uh, a good option for that. Um, I think that uh, a, the way that I use radiation therapy in, in my practice, if they've chosen to do surgery, is if the cancer returns or if the cancer right. comes back with being very aggressive outside of the prostate, then we can use radiation therapy as a backup in order to kind of so-called clean up the mess. Uh, the cancer that might be left behind or, or cancer that does come back, radiation therapy is a, is a second bullet in your gun to treat prostate cancer. Um, if you do radiation therapy to start with, doing surgery afterwards is very, very difficult because there's a lot of scar tissue involved and, and a lot higher risks involved with surgery after radiation therapy. Delving into the types of radiation, tell our viewers about the external beam treatment and how you would actually utilize that. So external beam radiation therapy is an outpatient treatment. It's very painless to do, it's easy to do, it's a long time commitment because typically you'll do one, one treatment a day, five days a week for seven weeks typically. Wow. So that's a lot of treatments, but it usually takes 20 or 30 minutes. The, the radiation centers are very, very good at getting you in and out, so it's not like coming to my office where you have to wait 45 minutes to an hour. And, you know, they, they, they're, they're ready for you and, and, and they, they'll get you in and out. Uh, and it's, it's painless, it's, a, um, it's like getting a chest x-ray. So, it's, it's something that's easy to do, and that's why the, the risks are very low as far as the actual procedure itself. Um, there are some short-term effects. People can be tired. People can be worn out. 
You can kind of have a mucousy diarrhea for several weeks mm -hmm. throughout the procedure and after the procedure, maybe some urgency and frequency with urination. That usually all gets better. Uh, down the line, 10, 15 years later, you can have significant problems. Fortunately, those risks are very low, less than 10% usually, but you can have problems with blood in the urine, blood in the stool, painful bowel movements, painful urination. Those type of things can happen with radiation therapy because radiation is indiscriminate in what it treats. It treats good cells and bad cells. Sure. So it can affect the, the tissue surrounding the, the prostate. And, and we try to limit that, and they do a very good job now of limiting the amount of cancer that's spread to the surrounding structures, to the rectum, to the bladder, to the sphincter muscle that lets you hold onto your urine, to the nerves that allow you to have erections. But those, those do get affected uh, because you want to treat the entire prostate, and the prostate's very close to all those structures. Sure. And what is the other form of radiation so treatment? The other form of radiation treatment is called brachytherapy Brachy. or radioactive seeds. Okay. So you know, people have mostly heard of radioactive seeds, and that's a day surgery. You usually go home the same day, so you do have to have an anesthetic, and it is considered a surgical procedure, though it is a minimally invasive procedure. And we use uh, ultrasound to identify the prostate, and then, radio and then needles to introduce radioactive pellets into the, into the prostate. And those pellets are usually the size of, size of a rice grain. So they're very small, and typically you, you put 40 to 50, maybe more depending on the size of the prostate, into the prostate itself. So now you have the radiation on the inside of the body instead of coming outside in, now it's inside out. And you can tailor the radiation therapy to uh, encompass the prostate and have less spread of the radiation to the surrounding structures. Now, it, the, the limitations of the seeds, you, you can't have too big of a prostate or you can't get the, the seeds to the entire prostate. Right. The other limitation is, is that if you have a more aggressive cancer, then it's not as an effective treatment for prostate cancer. So you need to have a smaller amount of cancer, a less aggressive type of cancer to be a good candidate for, for radioactive seeds. So would that be completed and accomplished in one treatment? One treatment. And how long would that typically take? Uh, it typically takes about an hour to do. And that's used in conjunction with a, a, a radiation oncologist and a surgeon at the same time in the, in the operative room. When I was doing my research or my homework, I was fascinated to find the term watchful waiting. Watch, right. Yeah. Uh, and I thought my initial reaction was, that's going to take a lot of patience. What is meant by watchful waiting? Well, watchful waiting or active surveillance, we don't like to say we're just waiting for something bad to happen. Sure. We're, so we actively surveil prostate cancer is kind okay. of a new term for, for watchful waiting just sounds better. Uh, but watchful waiting, active surveillance is not actively or aggressively treating prostate cancer. Um, and the thought process is, is that the, the prostate cancer is slow growing. If it's a small cancer and it's slow growing, then it may not affect a person in their lifetime. 70% of all 80 year old men have prostate cancer and they don't die with prostate, they don't die because of prostate cancer, they die with prostate cancer. So someone who's older, someone who has other medical problems may benefit from watchful waiting, keeping an eye on it. And that requires rectal exams and, and PSAs every three to six months. Um, you may need to do another biopsy every year and a half to you know, two years, kind of depending on what the PSA does to see if the cancer is growing or spreading. So watchful waiting, you don't do as many biopsies. Active surveillance, you're actively doing something. So we'll do more biopsies with that. And you know, really with with uh, recent controversy concerning PSA, which is a whole other topic, there, there are more and more people who are pursuing active surveillance. Younger guys may not be as good of, a, as good of uh, uh, people to, to pursue active surveillance because they're gonna live another 20, 30 years and the prostate cancer right. may affect them. Uh, older gentlemen who have other medical problems are I think really, really good candidates for active surveillance and, and really should consider that. If someone decides they're gonna do hormone treatment, mm -hmm. What is the duration of that? I mean, couldn't that possibly be ongoing for maybe the rest of their lives? Most, most of the time it is an indefinite treatment. It goes on for the rest of their lives. Uh, typically, if we do radiation therapy, it'll be in combination with hormonal therapy for sometimes two to three years, depending on the physician and, and, and what, their, what their beliefs are. So sometimes it's a short-term short -term process. And hormone therapy means that we actually stop production of testosterone with either a, an injection or actually removing the testicles. So obviously if you remove the testicles, it's a lifetime uh, sure. treatment. Uh, the reason someone would do that is because it's an expensive treatment. And so sometimes right. their insurances won't cover it or they can't, uh, can't afford it, or they don't wanna come to the doctor every six months to get an injection. Um, there are side effects that, that go along with hormonal blockade. As you can imagine, if you lose your testosterone, you're not gonna feel as strong. You're gonna lose muscle mass. Right. You're gonna feel uh, fatigued and tired. Um, and you're, you won't have a libido. You won't have a desire to have sex. You won't be able to have an erection because your, your testosterone is gone. Um, you're at higher risk for osteoporosis. It's kind of like a woman who goes through menopause. 
or a man who goes through menopause, it's, it's, uh, you'll, you'll lose bone density. So that has to be followed very closely and you need to be on vitamin replacement, vitamin D and calcium. Uh, so those are the things that you have to worry about with hormonal blockade. It's obviously you know, used in, in people who cannot tolerate any type of treatment for prostate cancer at all, who do not want to undergo an aggressive treatment, but want to do something to slow the cancer down. What you have to understand with the hormonal blockade is it doesn't actually increase life expectancy by very much, if at all. Right. So it may delay symptoms of advancing prostate cancer. It may, it may help with patients who have had an aggressive treatment, such as surgery or radiation therapy, and the cancer returns. You may want to treat with hormonal blockade to get the PSA down and slow the cancer down. And it really makes you feel good when you see that PSA at zero and, and very, very low. But it's important to understand that it's not a, it's not a, a treatment for cure. It's a, it's a right. palliative treatment. We're trying to slow the cancer down and, and kind of get it under control. Um, but eventually the cancer will become independent of hormones and can grow without testosterone. And then it becomes a really difficult uh, a disease to treat and you have to use chemotherapy agents. Uh, and, uh, and, and those can be tough to, tough to, to you know, undergo as well. Let's talk about survival rates. What are some of the survival rates? Typically what I'll tell my patient who has an organ confined disease, meaning the cancer hasn't gotten out yet and mm -hmm. it doesn't appear to have spread, is that typically 85 or 90% of the time we'll hopefully get a, a, a good cure rate. Now, I'll never tell my patient they're cured because I think you become overconfident and you don't return. And right. prostate cancer is not like other cancers where if at five years the cancer hasn't come back, you're cured. Well, at five years, if you had done nothing at all, you're likely to not have the, have the um, have any problems with the prostate cancer to begin with, especially if you've caught it at an early, early uh, disease time. So 10 years, 15 years, you've got to keep following up with your, with your, uh, your physician and have the PSA monitored. So you know, if we can catch it early, the cure rates are very, very high. If you catch it late, the cure rates drop precipitously and, and becomes a more, much more difficult uh, tr uh, disease to treat. What is the youngest age that you've seen someone affected I, over I've, your career? I've done surgery on a 39-year-old man so very, very young family history of prostate cancer. You've got to be very careful. Um, his physician was, who, his primary care physician was very hyper acute about the fact that he had uh, prostate cancer in his family. Got a PSA earlier than the typical recommendation, found that that was elevated and we did a biopsy and, and found cancer. Um, I've recently done just an amazing number of men in their early, early 40s, which has been surprising to me that that many, that many men, recently a 41-year-old man who had a very aggressive prostate cancer. It was small and we caught it early, but it was a very aggressive cancer. And there's no doubt in my mind that if this wasn't, if this wasn't caught early, he would die from his disease and hopefully we've caught this early enough. You've had an opportunity to mentor some of the other physicians in your career. Is that something you've enjoyed? It is fun to see uh, people you know, embrace a new, a new technology because as, as physicians, we really like what we do and we think what we do is, is the right thing for, for our patient or our practice. And when something new comes along, there's a lot of resistance to change. There really was. And, and I, I, I had a lot of resistance to my change. Fortunately, it was early in my career after residency that the robot uh, technology came along. So I, I was you know, w with several physicians in town, kind of an early adopter of this. But the main reason was because we were losing patients. Patients were going to Nashville, going to Vanderbilt. And I hated to see patients have to go out of town to, to uh, have a treatment that I thought we could probably do here. Sure. And so fortunately we were able to you know, learn how to do that and, and, and get a lot of experience. There are a lot of good physicians in town that are doing it and then more and more are trying to do it. Um, it's a, it's a hard, hard procedure to learn. There's a, a high learning curve in order to really become good at the procedure. Uh, typically it takes anywhere between 50 to 100 cases really to get to the point where you're, you're, you're very comfortable with the procedure. Sure. And then 200 or more and you're finally starting to think, you know, this is something that is you know, a, a routine for you. But every case is different. You, I think I learned something new on every single case that I do. I don't think that I'm you know, an, an expert and have got it all the way down. I'm, I'm always learning, I'm always going to meetings, I'm always training, and then I try to pass that on to other people to you know, help them so they don't have to go through a lot of the, the learning curve difficulties that, that I had to go through. What is your biggest challenge on an ongoing basis as a urologist? The biggest challenge that we as urologists uh, have, to, have to deal with, I think, is, is number one, resistance to identifying prostate cancer in mm -hmm. men sure. men don't like to go to the doctor. Right. So we've got to get awareness out. And this is, I think, a perfect opportunity to, you know, for, for me and you to say, to do that. Go, get, right. go, get your, go get your PSA checked, get your rectal exam. It's not right. really that bad at all. Sure. Um, 
some of my patients. Uh, one was a, you know, a very, a very well-known coach here in, in the area, and he didn't have his PSA done, and he didn't go to his doctor for five years. And we finally, when we found his cancer, it was in a very, very aggressive cancer. And so he's been very forthcoming about, you got to you know, go see your, your doctor, go get your PSA checked. I didn't do it, don't do what I did. Be smart about it, catch it early. And so that's the number one thing that I think that we deal with. The other issue is, is that there's a lot of resistance in the medical community uh, to really checking the PSA in, in some cases because there is a controversy. PSA is not great, it's not perfect. It's the only thing that we have though. And we're looking for new, new uh, screening methods all the time, but right now PSA is all we got. And so we've got to use it to our best ability and try to identify those patients who are gonna be, be good for watchful waiting, good okay. for treatment, Dr. Ramsey, very helpful, very useful information. Thank you so much for your time and for being here with me. Thank you for having me, I've enjoyed it. Pleasure. As you have just learned in my interview, as technology continues to progress, more and more patients will benefit from the use of robotics in the future. And a special thanks to Dr. Christopher Ramsey and his team for kindly accommodating our crew for this feature. We were invited into the operating room and were given an up close look at the tools and equipment utilized in robotic surgery and found it very interesting. We thank those of you at home for watching. Up close, I'm Chris Williams. Up Close with Chris Williams is presented by Tenova Healthcare with six hospitals and more than 1,000 dedicated physicians. For more information, tonova.com.